Welcome to the Good and Basic Podcast, a long-form conversation between Joseph and Joseph about the videos on our channel, the ideas we're thinking about, and the larger questions of life, the universe, and everything. Fusing together a bizarre mixture of appropriate technology and hands-on philosophy. So, let's go. That is right. Um, so, you may have noticed, if you're if you're listening to the audio version, then you probably don't notice anything different. If you're watching this on YouTube, you may notice we are in a slightly different and upgraded location. We both have microphones now, and I, I kind of feel like I'm a news broadcaster now, so... Uh, if if I break out into like newscaster voice, yes, then you know. Well, I don't know if I should apologize for that, but that's what's going on <laughs> if that happens. So <laughs> there we go. Um, you can find our social media information in the uh, comments below, as well as uh, we just recently launched a website, including a donation tool if you'd like to help support the content we produce. Thank you very much for listening and for your support. Thank you indeed. Uh, this week we have some really interesting topics to cover. I did two videos on uh, on some Polynesian boats. The first one was a Maori war canoe, and that thing was amazing because it was like 40 feet long, and it was carved originally. Those those types of canoes were carved with stone tools, and just the level of um, of decorative carving that's on mm -hmm. the front and back. There's this open work grill where you can see this highly intricate design and it's it's amazing carving work just by any standard and then you go and add to that this was done originally with rocks <laughs> so you know the, the games that you played as a child where you were making you know uh, mud pies and playing with twigs and playing with rocks apparently you can play that same game at such a, a boss level that it carves open work grills and and what rocks are they using are you they using like obsidian or are they using flint or from my Some understanding, rock? Uh, there's a very prized stone called greenstone in New Zealand, okay. but it only occurs in the South Island, and it was hmm. traded pretty widely. And they would use that to make uh, weapons like the the patu, I think it's called, the, the this paddle-shaped thing that you'd use to break people's arms, um, mm -hmm. and also uh, toki blades, which are the adze blades. But I also am under the impression that you can use basalt. I know that in the United States, the Mississippian culture had a very large-grained basalt that they loved using. As soon as they discovered a deposit of this stuff, they never went back to any other type of rock. Hmm. And for so, like stone tools. In that for stone tools. Okay. And they would make these big axe blades. Um, tons of them are found around Cahokia. Don't we have basalt deposits here in Utah? We do. We do, we do. Um, it depends on what technique you're using to make your stone tools. There's napping, which requires a, a pretty um, glassy type of rock. Basically, you're looking for naturally occurring glass. Mm -hmm. You're looking for something like flint or obsidian or chert or more obsidian or more flint or more chert, <laughs> something along those lines. Jasper, basically things that look like glass in the wild. Mm -hmm. And for that one, what you're doing is you're just breaking it in a controlled way because glass breaks in extremely predictable ways. It's always a cone-shaped crack. And you can control that to make that classic notched arrowhead shape that we're all familiar with. Yeah. But if you're polishing the ax, then, then you, your choice of materials opens up quite a bit. You can knock it out kind of rough with uh, breaking it, and then you polish it to get the edge that you want. And in that case, you're looking for uh, a mix of uh, material traits. You're looking for how uh, easy it is to shape in that initial breaking. You're also looking for how easy it is to shape while polishing, mm -hmm. so large grains are very helpful, and also how robust it is. We're going to have to go uh, pick up some basalt. Uh, we've already done an expedition, obviously, to go pick up um, some obsidian. Yep. And we need to do a sequel to that because we need to find larger chunks of obsidian. Yes. Um, but I've we, done more research on that, by the if way. If I recall correctly, in that same area, there were basalt uh, formations, were there not? So there were. We, there we ought to uh, go pick some of those up, too, and see what we can do with it. One of the things that I would love to do with basalt, speaking of amazing stuff that you can do with stone tools, um, if you look at uh, corns, right, <coughs> for grinding grain, sure. There is the, the flat type of corn called a metate, which is used in Central America to grind corn. And it's kind of this saddle-shaped thing. It's basically a saddle corn. But I saw one, it's a museum uh, piece, that has the same kind of open work carving and it's incredibly intricate. And that is stone that was carved with stone tools. <laughs> so next level awesome. <laughs> I'm not sure that I want to try that to that level, but I would love to make a metate. Uh, you know, thinking about the the level of decoration on these canoes one of the things I'm thinking about um, you know so first of all it's impressive because it was done by stone tools right it's sort of impressive on two levels it's impressive because it was done with stone tools and then it's also just sort of you know uh, uh, impressive in itself yep right um, you don't you know, think about the limitations of the tools because it's amazing on its own yeah rights. like you don't look at it and think this was well 
Yeah, you don't think it was made with stone tools because when you imagine stone tools, you imagine like Grug and Og with their club sitting outside the cave. Sure. Right. Um, the, I was thinking when we visited Open Lucht in the Netherlands, this open air museum. No, sorry. Open Lucht? Archeon. Archeon, that's right. We visited Archeon. Um, we visited both, but we're talking about Archeon here. Um, we visited Archeon and they have, you know, a, a variety of archeological themed exhibits uh, spanning a huge range of time, right? Yeah. Like all the way from the Stone Age up until the Middle Ages. Um, and so in the in the Stone Age section, they have these dugout canoes. And so we went and took, took these dugout canoes and started paddling around in these dugout canoes, right? Which you could never get away with <laughs> in a theme park in the United States. <laughs> but it was so cool. There were groups of school children wearing life vests, of course, and then paddling around in these dugouts, which you have to have a pretty good sense of balance in order to navigate. Yeah, so so there's two observations that I, I want to make about that. I wanted to make one, and then what you just said made me think of another. So the one is that those were very, very, very crude-looking canoes, right? Like sure. log with dugout section in the middle, right? Sure. You know, really, really crude, right? And that's kind of what you imagine when you think Stone Age canoes, right? But it's interesting that, you know, the level of care and precision, the level of, of, of technical prowess can range from, uh, you know, hollowed out log to, like, elaborate carvings. The Yosepa. Yeah. Which, let's just geek out for a second. That means Joseph. Yeah. It was named for uh, Joseph F. Smith. Um, so that's kind of fascinating. Uh, BYU Hawaii engaged in this project to make this replica canoe in the early 2000s, and, and the thing is just a monster. It's huge, it's intricate, it's incredible, and they've used it to sail to Tahiti and back. So that's a level of... I'm trying to think about the level of trust that you have, mm -hmm. the, the, the raw amount of faith that it takes to set out in this dugout canoe that you made yourself. Yeah. And then... Uh, fundamentally, yeah. it is a log. Yeah, well, or, right. or a collection of logs. Yeah, I mean, uh, but well, like, and when you think about it that way, it, it, it becomes really different, right? If you're like, well, I'm going to sail in a ship, you're like, oh, okay, well, that's a ship, right? Yeah. But then when you think, okay, well, wait a second, that ship is just a bunch of sticks that we stuck together, right? You're, it, it changes things, right? Yeah. It changes it changes your perspective on it. Especially when you can't see the landmass that you're trying to get to. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it's one thing if you're sailing out to that, that, you know, that rock that's a couple hundred yards out to, to sea and you're just... Sailing out to, st you can see you can the rock. See the, yeah, you paddle it's to the it's rock. Point you can tell if you're getting closer to the rock. Yeah, but as soon as you are surrounded on 360 degrees with an entire horizon of ocean, mm -hmm. um, okay, well, what exactly are we aiming for, and how do we know if we're actually making progress? I mean, like it's it's easy enough to get lost in the woods, even if you have a, even if you have you know visual references like the mountains or so forth. Yeah, right, which we have quite a few of in Utah. Right. But like <laughs> being surrounded in 360 degrees by nothing. <laughs> <laughs> See that line where this guy makes the sea. Yeah. 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 Oh boy. That, that, that to me is where this just gets to the next level. And the craziest thing to me, I, I never made this connection before actually seeing this particular seafaring canoe mm -hmm. is that, okay, let, let's assume that all the humans start out in one place, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. How did they get to the islands in the first place? You, uh, presumably, before you get to the islands, you yeah. don't. No one knows that the islands are there. Yeah. So you just sail out in that direction. For what purpose exactly? And what are you well, hoping to find? I and mean, how much I, confidence do you have to have in your sailing technique that well, you will be able to go and come back? I mean, you can imagine. You can imagine. It, it, I mean, presumably, they're like, okay, there could be land out there, right? Sure. Like, that doesn't sound too crazy, right? Yeah. To me, it's the question of I'm going to store up a ton, I'm going to store up a lot of food, I'm going to build a boat, and I'm going to go sail into nothing, <laughs> right? Or what looks like nothing. And I might find an island and I might not, right? Like this is kind of like the, the entrepreneurial conundrum, right? Is I'm going to sink some massive amount of resources, some substantial at least amount of resources into a project that uh, has an uncertain future. Yeah, a very, very uncertain future. And in this particular case, it, it highlights two things about that that the entrepreneur struggle. Mm -hmm. One, you kind of have to have an insane level of confidence, and that insane level of confidence is partially borne out by your actual ability, and it's partially borne out by an, an, let's say an inflation of your ability. <laughs> you have to be just a little bit crazy, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also, you, you look at the raw cost. Like the what the yeah. amount that you're really risking, yeah, and then the 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 terror and the promise and the the faith and the overconfidence and all of that just becomes more amazing. I mean, the way you want to kind of imagine it is it's like, I mean, you know, <clears throat> there's a good chance that 
you know, if you're listening to this, you've been in some kind of car accident. I mean, there's a chance you've been in a car accident where your car got totaled. Sure. Right. And, you know, depending on the value of your vehicle, you just saw hundreds or thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of dollars just like, poof, just they're just gone. Sure. Right. And it's not that they went somewhere else, right? Like you've spent money on things that you, you then got something back for. You did that when you bought the car, right? But this isn't a case of like watching a transaction where you give up something for something of, you know, what you see as greater value, right? Instead, it's, it's those resources disappear. Sure. They're gone. And if you're imagining cutting down the tallest tree in the forest, painstakingly carving it out with stone mm-hmm. tools. It's it's not like a car that costs a few hundred or a few thousand or a couple if you're, tens if you're of thousands. Of it no, this is this wage. is more like your your house. <laughs> or more. Yeah. Or more. Yeah. Right. Uh, it, it's so funny uh, how to make everything. Um, with their projects, they keep track of not only the raw amount of resources that they're using in terms of cost, but they also keep track of the number of hours that they spend. Mm-hmm. And then assuming you're paying yourself minimum wage, that boosts the cost. So his, uh, by a lot. his printed T-shirt that they made um, took three years to do yeah. and ended up costing f- over $5,000 if you took into account the labor. Mm-hmm. That's a T-shirt. Yeah. Now make it a, a seafaring canoe that you haul it out by hand. <laughs> Yeah, well, and it's, so pivoting into, sorry, we're not here to talk about, well, I guess we're here to talk about economics because we're here to talk about everything. Right? Sure. But um, but pivoting into economics for a second, pivoting away from boats, um, entrepreneurship really, really, really interests me because of those reasons. Sure. Right. And it makes me have a lot of respect for entrepreneurs. And it also, you know, like, I don't know if, your quote unquote average person who has either a salaried or paid by the hour job, like it's not necessarily that easy for them to appreciate that level of investment and risk. You know, if I, um, sorry, I'm trying to think this through just a little bit, but, but um, you know, if, if, if I work for some large company, right, uh, I, have, I have a dog in the fight, absolutely, right, they're paying me. Right. But if I lose my job, I can conceivably go get a job somewhere else. Right. I lose out on a few months of pay. And, you know, depending on, you know, how much I've saved and what my situation is like, that could be lethal. But, you know, in a very great many circumstances, like if you have a little bit of financial reserves or if you have, you know, uh, friends or family or community resources you can lean on. Right. Like losing your job is just not the end of the world. It's not an extinction level event. It's just not. Right. Um, Now, it it can be right. All these things depend on depend on circumstances. Right. Um, sure. And e- even if you do, though, right, like the level of that extinction is, is, you know, I mean, well, let's say you make, I don't know, 40K, 50K, 60K a year, right? Uh, then, you know, that's like your max, your, your max possible loss, right? Is that spread over the course of a few months, you know, assuming you find another job, so on and so forth, right? Like, I mean... It, 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 that's that's different though from saying you know I have some kind of seed capital, sure, right, which has been poofed. Yes, I, and and you know I'm going to sink. You know maybe I've gotten a loan for a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars, or maybe I've got you know maybe I've saved up enough seed capital to start my little pet project, right? And like you are planting that seed. You know now we're using a gardening metaphor, right? Like you are planting that seed in the garden. And you do not know if it is coming up. You do not know if it is coming up. And it's not like you can just dig it up and pull it back up again. If It's gone, gone. Sure. Right. I mean, you know, the nice thing about... The nice thing about being fired from a job, (laughs) if that's not too outrageous of a phrase, the nice thing about being fired from a job is that presumably you still have all the same skills. Right. Like you've lost your cash flow, but you still have the same, broadly speaking, earning potential. And also all the money that you've made up to this point, you presumably keep. Yeah. It'd be a little bit... But uh, but it's different to, you know, potentially watch that investment just like... It'd be a little bit like getting a mortgage on your house as a condition for getting a job. So there's a job uh, and in the application process, they say, okay, in order to get this job, here's what you need to do. You need to mortgage your house and you need to give that mortgage to us. And then you need to work for a year before we may or may not pay you. (laughs) And the chances of us paying you, let's say, are giving the, the odds for typical entrepreneurship projects about 50%. Isn't that what it's about? Or like 25? I, I would assume it would be lower, but let's just play with a number. Okay, let's play with a number. Let's say 30%. Okay. You have a 30% chance of getting paid at the end of this time. Yeesh. And <laughs> if you don't get paid, then you just walk away and we keep the mortgage. And that's the thing that you're going to do. And this is the crazy thing that gets us the, the products and services that we enjoy, like yeah. these microphones. Yes. That doesn't happen unless well, somebody's willing to... Yeah, put and, some risk on the line. And thanks for th- thanks for bringing that out and kind of refining the idea. I'm kind of thinking it out loud. I've never thought about it in precisely this way. Um, 
but but the the risk element is is kind of uh, that's the essential thing here. That's why uh, you know that's that's the difference. Um, particularly because like if you work a wage job, right? Uh, it's it's lower risk in the sense that you can more or less count on money coming in, right? Until I mean, you could get laid off, you could get fired, the company could tank, so on and so forth, right? Um, but you get a much lower payoff, but also a much lower uh, chance of disaster. Yeah. Whereas if you engage in an entrepreneurship type product, you, you get a potentially much higher payout, but there's a much larger chance of something disastrous occurring. It's a little bit like moving from a world where there are ceilings and floors to a world where there aren't. Like yes, yeah, ocean. no, that's exactly right. That's like exactly sailing right. out on the ocean. I mean, yeah. The, the max possible downside, well, you can't see the max possible downside. Mm -hmm. That's somewhere there on the ocean bottom. Ceilings and floors in the metaphorical sense, right? Yeah. Like that there's a theoretical bottom you could reach and a theoretical peak you could yep. reach. Yeah, well, and that's what I think this, like, the reason why we have people on all these Polynesian islands, presumably, is because people engaged in that entrepreneurial project and they were able to engage in that entrepreneurial project of, uh, of, you know, gambling away massive amounts of resources. And potentially lives. <laughs> yeah, that too. The, the crazy thing about that calculation to me is that you want as much assurance as you can get. Let's say it's never 100%. You're never going to be sure if your yeah. venture is going to work. <clears throat> For sure. You're never sure if you're going to survive the next voyage. There is always going to be an element of mm -hmm. courage involved. Yeah. But you kind of want to minimize it. As far as possible. As far as, as possible. reasonable possible, at least. And so the the skill of the wayfinder in being able to identify and find new islands or mm -hmm. being able to find the old ones, you know, and, and get back home so that you are mm -hmm. safer yeah. as you venture out into the unknown because you have a reasonable likelihood of getting back to safety. That's where it gets absolutely crazy to me because to locate yourself in in three-dimensional space and figure out where you are on the planet by reading stars and wave currents and, uh, I mean, wave patterns and looking at the weather and looking at animal life and looking at all of these things, it's just crazy to me that there is enough information out there that the gamble became a reasonable one to make, reasonable enough to settle all these islands. Yeah, well, and the other, sorry, I'm just kind of trying to imagine this situation in my mind, right? Like, you know when you learned how to swim, sure, right? And there's this moment where you're like, you're actually in over your head and you're far enough from the edge you can't grab it, right? Uh -huh. And, and there's, there's panic that sets in right then when you first learn to swim, right? Because you're like, oh my goodness. Normally what I do in this sort of situation is I touch bottom or I grab the side. And there's no bottom options. here and no side, right? I'm just surrounded, you know, like a, a, a seven-year-old or a five-year-old uh, out in like the five-foot section of the swimming pool is actually in a very similar situation. Not totally the same, but a very similar situation to these Polynesian explorers, right? They, they can't touch the edge and they can't touch the bottom. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the, 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 that, that courage element, right? Like you have, to, you have to imagine that as like, you know, you sail away from your island and, and after a day, you can't see your island anymore, perhaps, right? And then you're like, okay, well, like, I, I not, only, not only do I not know what I'm sailing towards, I might not even be able to find my way back. You know, it's crazy because there's there's multiple kinds of information that you're reaching for there. You have uh, concrete information, like you have a number in your head for how far you can swim. Sure. Okay. So this five year old can says, I can reasonably make it about as, as long as you know dad's arm span. That's that's yeah. a distance that I have traveled before. Yeah. I am pretty sure I can make yeah. that distance. Two feet. Or so. And so you can run calculations and say, Am I too far away to <laughs> swim a little bit? That I know how and reach the edge. Yeah. Um, you you've got that kind of thing uh, where there's some more precise information that you can use to calculate. Mm -hmm. What was crazy to me is while I was at the, the Polynesian Cultural Center uh, with my wife, we had a chance to talk with one of the uh, instructors who teaches at BYU Hawaii and teaches a class on navigation mm -hmm. using traditional Polynesian techniques. Yeah. And I mean, it's incredibly cool what he does. He, he was part of the uh, part of the, the, the organization that did this round the world voyage. Yeah. And he takes students out on the Iosepa and other ships like it to, to put into practice what they're learning. Um, is he, he kind of divided it into two classes of information. There's the sensory data that you're able to pick up, mm -hmm. but the sensory data doesn't interpret itself. And you don't know, uh, <coughs> you don't know precisely. Let's say that it, it fills in like 80% of the gaps. You, you know- Sensory data like? 
uh, watching the, these swell patterns, watching the, the birds, watching all these other things. But, you know, you're watching birds and there's a question, are they heading to or from? <laughs> there are questions like this, right? There are questions like this. And these questions have rather dire consequences. Are they heading back home right now or are they heading out? This is good to know. Um, so you have to be aware of things like the species and their habits. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of precision there and the precision is cool, but even beyond that, he was adamant about stressing intuition, mm -hmm. something that uh, Robert Piercig would call, you know, this pre-intellectual quality, pre-intellectual quality awareness to the point of almost clairvoyance. Yeah. And he, he was speaking of it in very religious language, mm -hmm. that this is a religious thing. This is a, uh, a faith in both senses of the word thing huh. that you're, you're aware of things. And, you know, one, one way of couching that in, in kind of the modern scientific paradigm is to say you're aware of things that you didn't know you were aware of. But even there, that doesn't get rid of the risk component. Are those birds heading to or from? Yeah. So, I mean, how much yeah. trust do you put in that pre-intellectual quality awareness? And the answer for these guys is your life, your crew, your ship, and all hope of seeing another yeah. day. Yeah, it's, it's a potentially extinction level event. Right? But the level like of trust, trust in it is yeah. high. Yeah. And yeah, because it's an extinction level event, that trust level has to be really high. Um, it makes me think. Taleb. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, uh, th this is one of your favorite quotes that you've pulled out of Nassim Taleb, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, clarify. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, w where there is a possibility of extinction, yeah. you cannot run a cost benefit analysis. Yeah. And his whole thing is risk analysis, right? Yeah. So it's all about He's how, an investor. How, how do you cap your downside without capping your upside so that it's like a ratchet going straight up to heaven where you're able to uh, make tons of money on the stock market or. Uh, generally live your life in a as risk-free way as possible or mm -hmm. in a way that uses risk to your benefit rather mm -hmm. than to your detriment. Yeah. But, you know, there's always a possibility Chance of, of extinction. extinction. Yeah. So does that mean we can't do anything or that cost-benefit analyses mm -hmm. are worthless? Well, and if I could get Nassim Taleb in a room, I would love to get him in a room and ask him about this because as far as I can tell, and in my mind, his views have matured and developed over the years as he's continued to write books. And you know, that's exactly what should happen, right? Like that's a good thing, um, right? But it's, it, it's interesting to kind of like try to chart those thought processes and see how some ideas deepen and then to see how some ideas run into problems and have to like, you know, modify and transform themselves in order to overcome those problems. And I think he, you know, accidentally walked into a very major problem with that statement, right? Because if... Uh, you know, he's very big on this idea that even if, you know, if there's, you know, it, it doesn't matter how low the probability of something is. Uh, you need to also factor in, and, excuse me, it doesn't just matter how low the probability of something is. It also, it also matters how bad it is, right? If you have a, if you have only a, you know, a 1% chance of death, it's like, well, that's actually, that's actually really scary because death is really scary. Well, you can no, imagine it's, this it's like as a casino game. Let's say that you have a 99% chance of winning $1 yeah. and you have a 1% chance of losing $1,000. Mm -hmm. If we play this game long enough, you're going to lose everything to the house. Yeah. Even though you have a 99% chance of winning a dollar. Yeah. Yeah. So you win one, a dollar, yeah. you win a dollar, you win a dollar. When you calculate you risks, you need to calculate the probability of the occurrence times the severity of the occurrence. Right. Either in a positive or negative direction. And so if there is a chance of extinction, well, let's just say that that is a negative infinity. Yeah then Roughly calculated. that game stops making any sense if you're calculating mm -hmm. rationally. Yeah, which I'm like, okay, well, Mr. Taleb, right? Uh, I, I struggle to think of a single scenario in which there's not a chance of extinction, right? Like driving a car has a chance of extinction, sure. right? Which means, you know, I in the long run, we are all, <laughs> we are all dead, to, to coin a phrase. Um, in the long run, we're all roadkill. And sure. so, so that, ends up, that ends up meaning, hey, wait a second then. Can we run any cost-benefit analyses at all? And if 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 not, then what have your last four books been about? And if so, then what have your last four books been about? Because, I, like, how can you run a cost-benefit analysis if you're saying a cost-benefit analysis can't be run when there's a chance of extinction? His most recent book is a book called Skin in the Game, which is available on audiobook uh, through Audible. And I guess this is as good yeah, a time as any well. to plug Audible. Um, we, we have a link below this video if you're watching on YouTube. It's available in the... Uh, in the comments section for the, the podcast as well. Yeah, the, uh, what, what do you call it? The show notes. The show, show notes. notes. Yeah, um, audibletrial.com. If, if you haven't like. already tried an Audible uh, subscription, with this uh, particular link, you can get a 30-day free trial uh, using our code. And then at the end of that, you can quit and be done. You also get a free audiobook during that time, which you get to keep even if you quit mm -hmm. your membership, which is really kind of nice. Mm -hmm. 
So your so max downside, to use our risk analysis, your max possible downside is a free audiobook. And or forgetting about it after a month and paying for a oh, okay, year's that worth is of a really good service. So, <laughs> you know, the, the depending on your perspective, that's the upside, right? Yes. Um, um, we do warn you it is a little bit like uh, cocaine. You know, the first hit is free. But uh, <laughs> but you're going to be back for more because it's a really good product. It's a really good product. I'm not sure how I feel about that analogy. <laughs> but uh, it's a service that um, I, I use the yearly subscription. Do you? Uh, I something like I, that. I use it. I think I do it on a monthly basis. Yeah. Okay. So, but, we're, but we're I do use different plans, yeah. and they're both so, good. Uh, yeah, anyway, all of Nassim Taleb stuff is on there, and it's all it's all fantastic. Um, his his thinking has influenced me personally more than basically any other philosopher that I can think of. So, this risk analysis thing, this book, Skin in the Game, um, he, he argues for the traditional values of courage. Like in leadership, yeah. you should be the, the first in battle, the mm -hmm. last in retreat. Yeah. This idea that you should be personally invested, exposed, exposed to, to the risk that's going to you know, hit, hit your uh, team that you're leading. And that that is, in some sense, the justification for the leadership role in the first place. The thing that gives you the right to lead is the fact that you are the most exposed. <laughs> and that should be respected and admired. And... This, this concept of courage is interesting to me because I would define courage as um, doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not, that's roughly that's speaking, not bad. That's not um, bad. And it, it, gets, it gets tied up with uh, traditional notions about faith as well. I think they're roughly the same thing. Um, with courage, it's, you know, I have a, a chance of total destruction. My downside is not capped. I'm rushing into this battle line. And if we, if we hold the shield wall and manage to keep this thing working and don't cower, then we could win and that would be really good and that would protect our, our families and homes and th then we conquer and get all and our treasure. And we would not have to learn French. And we would not have to, sure. Um, <laughs> C'est très bon. Um, then <laughs> you have uh, the max possible downside, which of course is your death and dismemberment. So, you know, that's, that's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, rationally, you run away. That is the rational thing to do. The rational thing is to drop your shield and run. And so courage is the thing that makes you do it anyway, despite the risks and the cost benefit analyses and the, the fact, presumably, that this rational thing to do would be to run away. And then uh, with, with faith, it's similar. It's a, it's a trust fall. I don't have any assurances, but I do it anyway. Yeah. And so courage in a nutshell is do it anyway, if it's good to do so. Yeah. And this is what I really want to get Nassim Taleb in a room to talk about, because his writings towards the end and towards like skin in the game, for example, skew very much towards this, uh, you know, language that operates in a moral register. It operates in kind of like a moral framework, right? Yeah. Whereas in the black swan, he's very like, you know, here are the numbers. This is why you shouldn't do it. Sigma six, this, that, and the other standard deviations. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, I'm not, I, I would love to probe at that because those are two very different registers of speech. Yeah. But he clearly has found, you know, at least for himself, a path from one to the other. So I would love to probe him about that because he never talks about it directly in his books. We should ask him. That, that would be a fascinating conversation. I would, I would, I would love to talk oh, to him about that. We ought to do this. Geeking out would we be incredible. Do this the, the thing that I find interesting about courage is that it's not just doing irrational things. If you're doing irrational things like <coughs> jumping off the roof to see if you can or to see if you can fly, that makes no sense. We normally assign that as stupidity, not Yeah, courage. it's straight up. It's stupid. So... What makes courage courage instead of stupidity? Um, <laughs> there's a, because they are closely allied. They are. They are. I mean, both of them involve <laughs> actions that could be classified as irrational. Yeah. Considering your self-interest. Yeah. Um, my, my dad, when he was seven years old, uh, learned in church that if he had faith enough, he could move mountains. Mm -hmm. And so he said, well, that's dumb. Why wouldn't I just fly over it? <laughs> and so he climbed to the top of a uh, construction site where my grandfather was working. Wait, and, how high up was he? Uh, a couple stories. And he, was he, like, he leapt, and with total childlike innocence, he had absolute certainty that he was going to dive bomb toward the ground, get enough airspeed, and then he was going to pull up airspeed. just like Peter Pan or Superman, and it was going to be awesome. And so he yelled, hey, Dad, watch this, <laughs> and leapt to his certain doom. And fortunately for me, he survived. Um, he managed to catch a bar on the way down and break his leg instead of his neck. Um, and so, you know, there's, there, there, it's, it's not enough to have uh, faith in irrational principles. The, the thing that made faith work later in his life, um, now he's an airline pilot. And so he puts he trust in 
in principles that work. And and he's constantly trusting. Like it's the same kind of trust fall. He didn't build. There's that a certain idea. amount of irrational irrationality. I mean, he um, he describes his job as being drastically overpaid ninety percent of the ninety nine percent of the time, and then drastically underpaid the other one, because you know in that one one in a hundred chance or one in a thousand chance, uh, the weather goes wrong and everything goes wrong and he is in the zone where he's having to make life and death choices, trusting in the plane, in his training, and in his perception of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so he's reading the situation similar to these wayfinders. Um, faith, there, there's, a, there's a concept in, uh, I'm, I'm speaking from my own faith here, from the Book of Mormon um, that uh, faith must be in true principles or it's not faith. Mm. Um, and that's, it has to be something which is not seen, but which is also true. Mm -hmm. Which is one of these odd consonances, right? You know, you know, like for all the ways that, you know, quote unquote religion and quote unquote science are different or based on different principles or have reached different conclusions or whatever, for all the degrees to which that, that might be true, right? Um, there are often some very odd consonances, right? Uh, you know, y your dad... You know, he, he so he does have experience, right? He's had experience flying these planes, you know, and he has some uh, sense from his own experience of what they do, right? Um, but the level of confidence that he has, I found out the other day, if I understand correctly, you might know this, right? Because your dad's the pilot, right? Uh, my understanding is that uh, on some or a lot of these large commercial jets, um, they'll, uh, they'll like swap out engines, like engines are good for a certain amount of on-off cycles and a certain amount of miles, and so they'll swap out the engines to do maintenance. So you might have the same airplane, and then somebody just comes along one day and like plugs a new engine on. Uh, I know nothing about this. Okay, that's that's, okay. I, I assume that I'd be curious to know more about it. Um, Sounds like a good quality control practice. Just don't yeah. only trust it so far and then swap it out. I yeah. know that that so was true the, for World War II era planes, but okay. I don't know about modern okay. quality control. It, it came up because uh, there was a, a pilot I was reading um, about who... Uh, he says, he pointed out that the airlines don't own the engines, they lease the engines. And the reason why is because if they owned the engines, they'd have to do all the maintenance on it. Um, but they don't. So they just come in and plug in new engines and then take the old engines away, maintain them, and plug them onto a new aircraft. Gosh, that's a level anyway, of trust. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is yeah. right? like, imagine being a pilot, right? And you, you, know, you look out the left cockpit window and there's a team that's just like pulling off your engine and putting a new engine on and you're like... Hope that one works <laughs> as good as the last one did. Yeah, right. So there is, there is you know, even in a, you know, a very... You know, frankly, uh, you know, physical science based, uh, physical engineering based job or role or, you know, set of tasks and capacities and so on and so forth. Like like being an airline pilot, it's like there's a lot of confidence going on. And, you know, think about the confidence that you have in the pilot. Right. You assume that the pilot, uh, you know, uh, didn't go on, you know, some kind of drug craze bender the night before. You know, you're assuming he doesn't fall asleep. Right. And the fact that you're right most of the time doesn't negate the fact that there's still trust involved. Yeah. Right. The fact that trust is validated doesn't mean it wasn't trust. Like the faith, the fact that faith is confirmed doesn't mean it's not faith. It's same with driving. I mean, th that's the classic example of running risks which have you know a, a uncapped downside. Yeah. But you drive all the time, mm -hmm. and you you trust other people to drive well, you. And the other people on the road don't have years of formal training like a commercial pilot. Does. No. And <laughs> funny enough, I I can't remember what the statistic was, but something like eighty percent of drivers consider themselves above average. So yeah, well, that's not true. I can the, tell the, math, <laughs> the math doesn't check out. So yeah, yeah that's well. kind of funny. I mean, I wonder about the other the other twenty percent because that's like, like a much more sober, sober. yeah, a very well, honest appraisal. Yeah, um, that's kind of a funny thing. They're like, I know what I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Oh, sorry. Dear. That's right. That's a thing to to mark in the comments below. Do you consider yourself an above average driver? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, Watches and everybody says yes. Of course, so it's all the other idiots on the road. Another detail that's interesting about uh, the these two videos that we posted about these these boats. Uh, one of them is about the Iosepa, which raises all these very interesting questions about faith and perception and entrepreneurship and the struggle to find and populate new islands. Mm -hmm. Like that is a huge, and we could honestly probably talk about that for hours more. But let's talk for a minute, if you're all right with this, about the, the concept of putting art in, even when it's not required. Okay, yeah, let's do this. This sounds interesting. So let's say that you are carving something with stone tools. It's way harder than carving with metal mm -hmm. tools. You um, are in a culture that isn't using metal tools, and so everything takes longer to do. Yeah. Um, it takes longer to grow your vegetables. It takes longer to comb mm -hmm. your hair. It takes longer to cut your hair with stone tools. It takes longer to carve anything. So you're going to build a house and 
you are going to spend longer than somebody who's using modern equipment is to yes. make that house. Yes. Are you going to put more art or less into it? Because the art is an additional cost. You're carving this thing, so it, it seems like it would be more expensive to put art into things well, in yeah, terms of your time. Be, but also, well, so I don't know if this is where you're driving. I assume it is that I'm thinking historically, uh, like the level of art seems to exist in inverse proportion with the level of technological development. That actually is a really interesting critique of industrial development. And I think aesthetically, uh, this is, again, I'm referencing Piercing a lot today, and I kind of hate myself for it. Um, the, good, the funny good. thing about... Let the uh, motorcycle Zen thro- flow through you. <laughs> <laughs> Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is a Soon book your which, journey to the dark side will be complete. It, it disturbs me. The book disturbs <laughs> me. But I find the language that it uses incredibly useful, even if it is low resolution, as I might hey, Maybe even, even, even crooked sticks can draw straight lines, maybe. Right? It's true. It is true. But thank heaven for that. Um, but there, there's this split of paradigms that he makes where there's the classical paradigm that sees things in terms of their underlying function or form. And they will see the, the motorcycle is a bunch of... You're laughing because no, I'm I am laughing because you hate this distinction. I, I do, <laughs> normally. But I, I think aesthetically it works. And then you have the romantic paradigm. So the classical paradigm will yeah. look at a factory and say, I understand its inputs and its outputs and I see its role in the economy and that's enough for me. Yeah. But the... The romantic it's kind paradigm. of this antiseptic mechanical view of things, roughly. Yeah, I mean, it, it does the thing, and so I don't really care what it looks it's like. It's all function. It's all function. And then the romantic is not all function. It wants form, too. It mm-hmm. looks at the factory and says it's belching nasty smoke, and it looks ugly, and it smells not terribly nice, and I don't really know what it's doing here. Mm-hmm. So I don't like it. It's ugly. It's ugly. And ugliness is enough to dislike something. Yeah. And it's interesting that industrial development kind of tends to be ugly. I mean, in, until the advent of like Adobe and Google, which have made their headquarters into colorful yeah. beanbag encrusted yeah, workspaces. I mean, you know, lest this turn into like a pure anti-industrial revolution diatribe, like one hypothetical possibility is that we just needed to go through like, you know, a hundred years of ugly stuff. And then we can make And then all again. of a sudden Adobe would make like, you know, actually fairly aesthetically appealing buildings corporate and, buildings. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I don't know if they build... I don't know if they build the buildings themselves or if they lease them. Whatever. It, the point is, the buildings are much nicer now. Sure. Right? They look much more aesthetically appealing than, like, I don't know, brick tenements in Chicago in the 1800s, something like that. You know, one thing that I've wondered about... Um, w- well, an example first. Um, the Vikings. Um, I, I, have, I have a theory about artwork in the ancient world. One of them is that, okay, so you have the winter, right? And you don't have Netflix, Mm-hmm. So Can you, you could it? decorate things entirely out of boredom half the year. Huh. And so maybe that's what you're doing huh. instead of Netflix is just carving geometric designs over and over huh. and over and over and over again. No matter how crude the tools are, if you give enough time to somebody, you'll get pretty good at do, it, right? You'll get pretty darn good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I learned this about uh, some Viking artwork is that they tended to decorate things even that you would never see, like the inside surfaces of some knife fittings, like... It, the the raw amount of decoration was really high and apparently it, it, it even went in places mm-hmm. that you were never going to see. Mm-hmm. Um, one other th- possibility, and this is the, the skeptic in me, is that there might be a selection bias. Maybe the only old ancient stuff that we save is the pretty stuff. And so maybe most of it was ugly, but the uh, all... Even if that's true, there's still a lot of beautiful stuff going around. Yeah, and a lot of carving in areas that we typically wouldn't think of as needing carving. Yeah. So I, I, I do think that it's probably more than now. But, uh, you know, one of the reasons might be that they just had less entertainment, so maybe there's that. And another reason could be uh, I, I cultural. I mean... It's it's for ritual, um, yeah. You know the classic uh, archaeological is, trope. Well, and there's the thing is, I think we really don't fully understand it, right? Like if you go to a museum, a lot of the times they'll say, "Well, you know, this was a decorative something or other, and it belonged to the chief of such and such tribe." And you know, the fact that it was so decorated, you know, it's high status because that means that it took a long time to make, right? Kind of like a riff on the on the Marxist labor theory of value. Which, which I have a really hard time <laughs> taking seriously. I have a really hard time agreeing with. Um, you know, the, like the mere fact that you, be, for the simple reason that the mere fact that you spend time working on something does not actually make it valuable, right? Um, sure. I, I'm thinking about the, the polished uh, dirt spheres. 
uh, yeah. in, in Japan, there's a tradition of polishing a, a sphere of dirt until yeah. it until it shines. And mm -hmm. It's really remarkable. There's some really mm -hmm. cool videos on YouTube demonstrating this process, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to buy it for the number of hours that the person put into yeah. it. You know? I mean, clearly it was valuable to you because you made it. And, you know, that's very nice and I'll pat you on the head, but uh, that, that surely does not mean that I value it. I mean, it doesn't even necessarily mean that I should value it. I, I think there's a difference between value and expense. If that makes sense, like uh, the, the labor theory of value works for measuring how expensive something is to produce. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not for your ability to unload it onto the market and sell it to somebody else, mm -hmm. because that requires them to value it more than yeah, you did. It requires exchange value. Exchange value. But in terms of expense, expense alone in and of itself can be a value if you're looking to conspicuously consum consume. Yeah. So if I want to demonstrate wealth, I, I'm going to do it by mm -hmm. wearing something that could only be made by mm -hmm. hand and would take a bazillion hours to produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I, I do partially buy that, right? Sure. Like there is such a thing as conspicuous consumption, clearly. Um, but I also have trouble believing in conspicuous consumption until a lot of other base needs have been met. Sure. Right. Sure. So that, that's a thing so, that you can so say. I, I guess I guess I should clarify. I'm not against this whole like conspicuous consumption of beautiful things as as a theory totally, um, but I don't think it has anything close to soul explanatory power. One thing it seems For to why imply, people would make beautiful decorated things. Well, depending <coughs> on who's making the beautiful decorated things, if it's only the rich within a community, yeah. then maybe maybe base needs aren't being met all the way down the social hierarchy. Mm -hmm. People at the bottom aren't getting enough to eat. That's also plausible. They, they, they can get a few extra dollars by carving a special thing and, and selling it up, the, up yeah. the hierarchy chain. But if even the poor are decorating their things, then it seems to me that you can infer from that that all the base needs are met, mm -hmm. which means that people have downtime. Yeah. Which w is the thing that I tend to infer from seeing beautiful objects that are handmade by typical people. Because any time that you spend decorating is a time that you're not spent fishing or hunting or growing crops. Mm -hmm. You are... Yeah, this is kind of a Maslow's hierarchy of needs yeah. type thing. Right? You will not be carving until your belly is full. Yeah. Unless you're an extremely, extremely dedicated religious zealot, maybe. Or, or you're filled less, with a creative mania. But or th if there's nothing all, else that you can do and it's the boredom thing yeah. again. These are, the, uh, these are all exceptional cases, though. Sure. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, I want to kind of pivot and put a different angle on this. Sure. Um, which is, so when you and I went to um, Europe last year, we went to the UK, and we visited quite a few, should I, should, I, should I say quite a few cathedrals in the UK? We visited an, a number of cathedrals in the UK, right? Sure. And, and that was actually my first experience ever seeing a cathedral. Right. Uh, well, uh, technically, there's there is a Catholic cathedral in Salt Lake, and I've been there. But you know, one of these you know old, sure. you know, like 500, 600, 700 thousand year old uh, cathedrals of of old Europe. Right. Um, so my first time. Right. And and they're, they're absolutely staggering. Yeah. They're absolutely staggering. I don't. I, I I do not know if I have ever seen anything like it. Right. Maybe if I went to Asia and saw like those you know 150 tall statues of the Buddha, it might be something similar. Right. Um, but like uh, these cathedrals are are, are massive. Sure. Right. And there, there are these staggering architectural accomplishments. Right? And they're not simple either. Like no. Rather than just a simple round pillar, I mean, it's, it's fluted all over the place. Yeah. And, you know, that's made out of a whole bunch of segments of stone. And each one of those had to be carved precisely to fit yeah. the one below. It, it, it's incredible. Yeah. And then you look at all the Gothic carving on the top on yeah. some of these old ones. And so, so there's all kinds yeah. of, like, decorations around the edge, right? Like, there'll be carvings of uh, Catholic saints and stories from Scripture and so on and so forth, blah, blah, blah. Right. But then, you know, you're, you're also bringing up these pillars, right? Even something very functional like a pillar will be incredibly decorative. To the point of ornate, almost yes. over the top. Yes. It's incredible. No, I think over the top is almost the right way to put it, right? And these cathedrals take a long time to build, right? They take a long time to build. Actually, I, I'm thinking of a parallel example. When the Mormon pioneers came to the Salt Lake Valley, they spent 40 years building the Salt Lake Temple, right? Like, you know, pulling granite blocks down from the canyon and building this thing. And you're like, 40 years? That is a long time to build something. Right. You know, I mean, we're throwing up, you know, if you're talking about like a residential house, some uh, some, uh, you know, new neighborhoods are going up near where my parents live. And, you know, I mean, they're building those houses in a matter of months. Sure. Right. They could do it faster if they wanted to. I think in 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 Wuhan in China right now, I think the Chinese government, you know, like build a prefabricated hospital with like a thousand beds, if I uh, am recalling the numbers correctly. Right. So the, and they did it. You know, like that, incredibly fast, right? Like a, th sure. a thousand bed hospital. You know, you, you see the pictures, and there's like a hundred 
backhoes all working at the same time in the same area, right? It's just insane, right? So uh, the... Largely as a PR stunt, but sure. It, well, yeah, we can talk about motives, but as a pure engineering feat, you're like... They, they did it. That's yeah. remarkable. You can just, like, build a hospital, <laughs> you know, in a, I, I, I wish I could remember if they did it in days, weeks. I forget. It must have been days because the Wuhan virus has only been a thing for a couple of weeks now, so it must have been, you know, a week or two at, at very most. Right. Um, anyway, so so my point is... We don't, like, if you're going to spend 10 years or 40 years or 100 years or multiple hundreds of years building a cathedral, right, like, how important does that have to be to you, right? If you're going to spend goodness knows how long carving decorations on your canoe, right, like, how important is that to you? And so, like, I'm, I'm it makes me think, you know, like, Okay, well, in the modern world, like, what's our equivalent of the canoe or the cathedral? Like, what's the thing that we think is just so insanely valuable, you know, sort of in and of itself, perhaps, um, that we're going to throw a massive amount of resources into it, even though we don't get anything of it at all for a while. And yeah. we probably never get anything that is of, like, direct sort of concrete material measurable. Especially when it crosses over the limit of a lifetime, like in building a cathedral. Yeah. You're not going to see it before you die. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 like, it's uh, you, you think about kind of like the pyramids. And, uh, actually, I believe the pyramids were mostly not made by slave labor, if I'm remembering correctly. I think I think the, the current theory is that it was mostly not slave labor. Anyway, the point is, um, you know, something like building the pyramids, like you have to wonder, like, first of all, what's our modern equivalent? Right? Like, what's the thing that we sink? that we see is so valuable that we'll sink massive resources into it. And really sink them, because you don't get them back. Ever. Potentially, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, depending on how you measure your your, your payoff, right? You know? Sure. Um, and then, then the second thing that I think is like, you know, I struggle to think of an example, and then I'm like, wow, like, are we even capable of that? Like, could we engage in a 400-year project. project to build, you know, not a cathedral, but anything? It's interesting that... Uh, two things about the, the labor theory of value or something very similar to it. So you don't measure value that way, but you can measure how valuable it is to the creator of yes, the thing. Yeah. And it, I, I did a video a long time ago about uh, a stone sphere that yeah. was found in uh, Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. And these stone spheres, they find them all over the place and they were hand pecked with, with stone. As near and as these are big stone spheres. They're huge. Yeah. So they're, what, what, the one that's here on uh, BYU campus is what, like two, two and a half feet, feet across something like in that. In diameter. You can imagine how long it would take by pecking at a stone to make a thing. So you start seeing, instead of a stone sphere, you see a number of man hours. Yeah. And the, what that number of man hours tells you, what it doesn't tell you is why they mm -hmm. made it that. Yeah. I mean, for that, you have to kind of look and say, okay, what could you use a giant stone sphere for? I'm not thinking of a very long list of uses. Must have been <laughs> status, must have been ritual, I have no idea. But the one thing you can say with certainty is, if someone put that many hours into it, it mattered to them. Mm -hmm. And it mattered to them to the amount of the sacrifice that went into it. Yeah. And so sacrifice is a measure of value to the creator of the thing. Yeah. And well, and I, I've already said, you know, I'm not a fan of the labor theory of value fundamentally, but I think this is, you know, you know. It doesn't handle exchange at all, but it does but handle. But I think you raise an extremely fair point, right? Like, the sacrifice to the person who made it. You must have thought it was worthwhile if you did it. You at can least imagine compared someone, to the alternatives. Someone steals your canoe after you put that many hours carving the thing. You can imagine the feeling of loss mm -hmm. that, that happens at that point. Yeah, you'd, yeah. you'd, yeah. you'd feel like a piece of you was gone. Or at least a, a large portion of your I mean, life. Yeah, a, kind of, a, a piece of you kind of is gone, right? <laughs> like hours and hours of you is gone. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, well, I don't know. Like, do you have anything to say about that question? Like, do you think, like, do we have anything that's the equivalent of, like, the pyramids or the cathedral or, or, or those canoes? Like, something that we invest a large amount of resources in, even though it, you know, quote, unquote, doesn't make sense? You know, here's that courage thing again. Um, because to, to value really... Uh, I'm, I'm going to step back and be just a little bit more broadly philosophical at this point. Sure. Um, it is really easy to take the position that nothing matters. Yeah, it's, easy, it's easy because it's really hard to point at things and say, where is the mattering? Wh yeah. Where what, Where is the matter in matters, right? Yeah. Y you can't measure it. It doesn't weigh anything. You can't smell it. You can't mm -hmm. see it. Um, it seems to be really subjective in the negative sense that mm -hmm. maybe it matters to you for now. Yeah. Matters I mean, to you, there's nothing cares? permanent about it. There's no actual value there. There's just matters to you. Yeah. Um, and so it's really easy to be pessimistic about the whole thing. Um, I, I did a video about part of this problem when we went to Scotland and we're talking about um, 
David Hume. But I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, no, I'm just going to say it. Uh, things do matter. And in order to believe that, it requires courage to believe it anyway. Because, I mean, the fact that you got out of bed in the morning proves that you thought that your life matters mm -hmm. and that your task list of things to do today matters. Mm -hmm. And th there's something noble about that in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And so th th there's something noble even in, in the subjective act because it implies mm -hmm. that you have put your money where your mouth is and acted in accordance with your values. And that... that um, Maybe it doesn't get you all the way there, but it is it is part of this value thing. And that that's true, even if even if hypothetically it is all like pure Sisyphean labor, like pushing a rock up the hill only to see it. Yeah, that, down that, that's kind of the existentialist point of view that the the, the doing matters more than the deed. Yeah, um, roughly. The, the, even even if the even if we do live in kind of like that nadir of, of being, but like there is something noble about like you know making something out of it. Yeah, doing doing good. But you, you add to that one other additional detail, and I, again, I'm going to reference Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, uh, but you, you do know the difference between better and worse. You, you are able to perceive that, and do we understand exactly how you perceive that? No, but I mean, you know if something's valuable or worth your time, you feel that, and that, that sense can be made more and less sensitive by following it. So mm -hmm. if you follow it, you become more sensitive and it becomes more accurate. And that allows you to find islands in the middle of the Pacific. Yeah, well, so, yeah, and... Sorry, I've got, like... It's accurate enough to be useful. To I yeah. mean, qualitatively useful. Yeah, I mean, well, again, like, you're like, well, you know, yeah, I mean, true. what happens if you go to, like, these Polynesians, you know, I actually don't know how long ago it is, uh, thousands of years ago? I, I forget the exact dates, um, but... Oh, if I remember correctly, some of the, the modern research suggests that it's actually pretty recent, like a thousand years ago. Okay, round numbers, a thousand years ago, right? Sure. You know, like I can go and tell him, you know, like, okay, buddy, this is absolutely stupid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't know if anything's out there, and you're probably going to get lost, and who knows what monsters live in the deeps, because you've never been there. Right? Sure. Uh, and who knows if you're going to find an island, and even if you do find an island, how are you going to get back? Yeah. And, and let us you, know about it. Are you going to bring your wife and kids with you on this mad fool expedition yeah. of yours? Okay. Like, so, so yeah. I mean, there is kind of this aspect where, like, I can berate him all day. Sure. And I can make very good points all day. And at the end of the day, he can still give me the middle finger and sell off and make it happen. And then right? he did. Or or fail and say, yeah. I'm okay with that. Right? Sure. Like, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm that's I consider to have been higher value to have attempted and failed than to not have attempted. Uh, that is the other half of courage, is that you don't... You have courage it's not in order to succeed every time. You have courage if you're willing to do it, even recognizing the cost. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, yeah. And, and so, so I guess, yeah, that's absolutely true too. I, uh, I, I can berate him and you know argue with him and try to convince him all day long, and I can marshal as many good reasons as I want. Um, but at the end of the day, right? Like, he might still be right. There still might there might be something that I haven't seen and something that I don't understand. Like no matter how good my arguments are, no matter how logical they are, no matter how make the, how much they make sense, right? Like I can't categorically rule out the possibility that there's something that I haven't experienced or don't understand or don't know yet. That makes him right and you wrong. <laughs> and, and the proof of the pudding there would be that I mean the Polynesian islands were settled, and the, the, the thing to get worked there was the thing. The yeah. thing worked. It did. Right, and the thing in this case being, you know, uh, yeah, careful but still moderately insane courage. Careful but still moderately insane courage. Yep, I, I'd even amp up the moderately, but sure. Yeah, I mean, well, it, and it depends at what stage and so on and so forth. Sure. Right? Well, and you also think about, I mean, we could draw the same analogy to, to space travel, right? Like, I was thinking about uh, Neil Armstrong the other day landing on the moon, and I was just like, like imagine what that is like. Sitting on the right. equivalent of a nu several nuclear bombs. Yeah. I mean, I forget what and, the statistic and, and was. You're so of fuel. far away, you know, like, I mean, if I get lost in the mountains, in the Wasatch Mountains, you know, next to Provo and Salt Lake, it's like, you know, I could die, but I have a very good chance of wandering home. Sure. You know, even if I were to get lost, I'll run into a road, I'll run into a trail, I'll run into a human, I'll run into something, right? But like in space, there's not really any coming back if something goes wrong. And, and what space is now is possibly not that far off from what the ocean used to be. When you look at the mortality rate that we've had with space travel up to this point and the fact that we've brought almost all of our astronauts home, I mean, that is 
so ludicrously crazy. I mean, I think the worst accident that we've had was Apollo 10, I believe. Well, where we there was the Challenger explosion. We had Challenger and we had Columbia. Yeah. Those, are, those have been the two biggies. And then the, the Russians have lost a couple. But still not a bad mortality rate for, we got for all the moon for putting back people in little steel boxes and throwing them into space on on rockets which are basically you know controlled explosions yeah that's right. crazy still still pretty good mortality yeah, you have rate a lot that's of not faith bad. in your numbers yeah and also in the efforts of all the other people who built the thing because yeah. the guy who's sitting on the rocket is not the one who built well the and also I even want to push that a little further it's also uh, faith in you know bluntly something you can't see because you can run numbers on things that you've done before, and you can run numbers to project what will happen in the future. But when you're running numbers to project what will happen in the future, it hasn't happened yet. Exactly, exactly. You absolutely do have faith in something that you can't see. Yeah, but which in this case is that your numbers are very, very, very right. Yeah. yeah. Gosh, this has been interesting. I did not expect this conversation to turn into a discussion of courage and faith, but it's actually been really kind of cool. I'm, I'm grateful for that. I agree. We need to get Nassim Taleb in a room. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still curious if you, if any listeners want to tell us in the comments what you think like, sort of like the modern equivalent of a cathedral or a carved canoe is. I'm actually quite curious about that because that's, I, in my mind, that's a real way to find out what it is that people value. It's what they're sacrificing. It's a really interesting sort of like cultural in analysis the project. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, with okay. that, I think we better wrap that up. Yep, we'll close up today. Thank you uh, very much all for listening. Um, we love your comments. We love your support. Thanks very much. You can find our social media information in the description. And if you'd like to donate to support us, you can go to goodandbasic.com. And there's also some other cool resources there. So thanks very much, and we will see you next time.